this is uh, a message. I, I don't know if I should say that I'm starting a series because I don't know that it's going to go any further beyond this, but we could call it the Rainbow Series. Uh, if you guys were uh, with me last week, I had a little rainbow uh, in my message, and it was you know, sort of fun from my vantage point. I'm not exactly sure if everyone else enjoyed it. Uh, and sorry that the notes are printed, printed in black and white. Uh, that is definitely a, a, you know, a, a disappointment when you have all this color on the screen. But this message is called Bleeding Hearts. And there's a certain people uh, in, our, in our world that are known as bleeding hearts. And they're known as the liberals. And there's, I don't know how many liberals we have in here. I would say uh, I have a tendency to be like a magnet for those that are not liberal. Uh, and yet, at the same time, it's interesting because when you say something like a bleeding heart, I just want you to ponder it for a second, okay? Just sort of sit there, because I understand the concern over a bleeding heart. This is someone who is moved by emotion, moved by feeling, and they oftentimes lack any sense of what is true, what is factual, what the Word of God says. It's like, who cares about what the Word of God says? I feel something. It's like, what a terrible way to live your life. It's going to lead you right over a cliff if, you're, if you follow just what you feel, And so I'm going to prep you right now. This is going to be a rather rocky message for some of you uh, because we're going to go into terrain that isn't divided into a two-party system. Truth is not divided into a two-party system. That's the enemy that wants to divide us. And he wants to segregate parts of truth over here and parts of truth over here. Where then you end up being against a whole facet of truth because it is associated with this misuse of it. And I get it, I've grown up in the same culture and time period you have been, and I see it, okay? I am like conservative by nature. Everything about me is conservative. I'm like an old school guy. I'm not looking, I would be happy without the internet, okay? I would be happy to not progress. I like old things, right? And yeah, I do like technology, don't get me wrong. And so I, you know, I have an iPhone, I have a Mac computer, and someone showed me the other day, well, it was actually a while ago, that I was sitting in Starbucks, you know, which is a symbol of a siren, okay, which isn't a positive one, and then I have on the back of my computer a apple with a bite out of it. Uh, and it's like, you do know what that's a symbol of, right? It's like, wow, what am I participating in? Uh, and so we are in a, a world that is mostly defined in our culture of an ever-growing liberalism. It's a meltdown of truth, and it's a very feelings-oriented society. And that's one of the classic definitions of a liberal compared to a conservative. A conservative has a tendency to lend more emphasis to that which is thought through, that which is concluded and uh, deduced through reasoning with truth. And then the liberal is that which is compassionate, that which feels their way. And so the conservative, like me, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, I'm definitely a conservative if you gave me those two definitions. I'm a a guy who wants to reason it through and think it through. I'm not going to feel my way through these things. At the same time, what happens is you have the, the, the conservatives on one side, which have a tendency to emphasize morality, justice, truth. And they, this other side emphasizes compassion and mercy. And it's a very dangerous thing if either side begins to stare at the other and say, that's wrong. Both have an element of truth. However, both need the other element to be fully functional, which is why I'm going to say this could step on your toes a little because I am, though I'm not liberal, and I do not like liberal ideology, and I have no interest in going away from what the Word of God says, I am very interested in getting that feelings dimension of Christianity rightly situated so that it is a service unto our Christianity instead of something that we're afraid of. Bleeding hearts. Oh boy, this is going to be a fun one, guys. My clicker just decided to not work. Okay, did you press that forward? Or was that, okay, so, oh, that's fixed now. All right, so raw materials for our message. This is what I did last week. I had seven different truths, and they're all based on a color of the rainbow, okay? And then, you know, and then we're going to mix them together and end up with rainbow, and it's fun. So the first one is the dangers of Republican Christianity. Uh-oh, boy, that, that, that'll be an interesting uh, sub point. And then fact, faith, and instead, of, I usually call it fact, faith, and experience. This kind of day, I'm calling it fact, faith, and feelings, 
And then the yellow color is the power of God feelings. Number four is sin, the distortion of human feelings. And then blue, well, I, I should probably just go to this next slide, except for my uh, thing is not working, so I can't go to the next slide. Uh, there we go. Did someone else go to the next slide? Okay, I need to know what power I have and what I don't have. So, uh, so and then we have the number five, blue, the temple of the Holy Spirit, and six, the choicest part of the sacrifice, and number seven, bearing his burdens in this world. Oh, thanks, bud. All right, so uh, number one is our red color, okay? Now, we're, we're working our way through Roy G. Biv, if you know the colors of the rainbow. And so we're going to start with red. And this is the dangers of Republican Christianity, and that's a good red, red one, don't you think? I mean, that's the color of a Republican is, is red. And uh, I'm going to say it this way, the risk of forsaking the bleeding heart. You see, I am... If you asked me, Eric, have you ever not voted Republican? That would be an interesting question. There is one time, okay? There is one time I did not, and that was in a president, my first presidential election that I voted in. It was Bob Dole and I think Bill Clinton. And I couldn't get myself to vote for Bob Dole. And so I voted for some constitutional party guy and he lost big time, right? And that's when you realize, when you feel like you waste a vote like that, you know, and it, doesn't, it didn't even matter at all, you begin to realize, that, okay, we really are in a two-party system. I have to choose between two. And I am decidedly pro-life. As a result, I have a tendency to be very Republican in my voting, right? And be almost, you could say, for that reason, but there are others. I'm a limited government guy. I don't want big government. I want limited government. I don't want the government telling me how to raise my kids. I want to tell the government how it's supposed to handle its job, not it tell me how to handle mine, right? And so that's, again, classic Republican side. I don't really care about the gun side of it. That's not gonna stir me at any level. There are other issues, you know, the people are like, oh, what do you mean you're not passionate about that? I'm not, I really am not. I've never owned a gun. I have no interest in, well, I have shot a gun. I'm, in, uh, I'm, I'm with uh, Kip and Harper in this one outdoors program and we're in shotguns right now. And so yes, I have shot a gun. And it's not that interesting to me. I actually am pretty good with a rifle, though, uh, if you ever. Uh, <clears throat> but my passions do not lie in politics. I have a background in constitutional law. So for all practical purposes, I should be very passionate here. And I also have a background in the Denver Broncos, and so I should be very passionate in regards to sports. And yet I have had to make a choice along the way to make sure I major on majors and minor on minors. For those of you that feel like our culture is going to be first and foremost changed through politics, that's where you're going to see a discrepancy between your thinking and the way Eric thinks. I believe that our culture is first and foremost changed through spiritual revival. So therefore, I have decided somewhere along the line to put more emphasis in spiritual reviving of a culture than political. At the same time, I am not ignorant of the power of political voting, okay, of my vote and the systems of government, I understand the value. So it's not my ignorance in that. I am very passionate about it, but it's a lower level passion. I have deep care, but it's a, it's a lesser care than I have for the kingdom of heaven, which is why I don't talk politics in church. And it sounds like, you know, with this platform and the tens of thousands of people that are listening to me, I could sway things, right? And yet I choose not to make that my focus. And then I stick this on the screen. It's like, Eric, what are you doing? The dangers of Republican Christianity. Now, what I, what I want you to recognize is the distinction between the two is, like I've already said, that I have a tendency, if left to my own devices without the care of the Holy Spirit over my life, I'd probably be a legalist because I like things orderly. I want to do things with excellence. And so therefore, God, give me the rules and I'll keep them. And yet that leads to death, it does. I have a very high esteem of morality, of, of purity, of the things in life that lead to showcasing the kingdom of heaven through the human body. Yes, and so do a lot of Republicans, if I could say it that way. And then we have a tendency to be against those that have a deep compassion, a well of compassion. They're just wired for compassion. And they look out at a dying world and they say, don't you guys care? And things like immigration, it's like they see the, the poor Mexicans down there unable to get in. And the Republicans like, 
We need to take care of our own first. We take care of our family. We don't take care of someone else's. If we're forsaking our own family, we're no better than infidels. And then the other ones are bleeding their heart for the poor Mexicans that are stuck in a bad situation that they can't get across the border. And I would say there's a truth on both sides. And I would say it's important for us not to play any of these things in life politically first, but spiritually. And say, look, I need to care for my own home. And I do need to care for this body. And I do need to seek excellence. And God needs to give me the grace to even do that. I can't even do it in my own strength. And I also want to be a man whose heart bleeds as God bleeds. You go to that cross, stick Jesus on it, and watch how he dies. You know how he is, according to medical uh, a medical practitioner, how Jesus died. And you could say, well, because of crucifixion, obviously. Because when that spear went into his side and out came blood and water, it, that is a statement that his heart had imploded, which means it is safe to say that he died of a broken heart or he died of a bleeding heart. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. If you are sweating blood, that means you are close to dying already. This is such trauma on the human body. And Jesus is going to bear a burden. And his heart is, in a sense, going to be crushed for us. And there's something there that I don't want us to forget what he is dealing with is justice, and he's crushing the head of the serpent. He's dealing legally with all the wrongs the enemy has done. He is setting the captives free. He is bringing redemption. There's a whole bunch of legal things that the Republicans love. Good legal activity by Jesus Christ, and also good loving activity. What we see is the incredible picture of the combo package. So, remembering the cross. So whenever I do like this as a 1A, it's still red, right? But it's a sub point under it. And I say the ultimate blend of red and blue, red being Republican, blue being Democrat. Yeah, the cross. In other words, you have all the feelings, all the compassion, all of that whipped into all that is right, all that is true, all that is just, all that is holy. And when you wing, put those together, you get a picture of Jesus Christ. It's like choosing one of the genders and saying this, one gen this gender's better than the other. It's just a dangerous thing to do, right? Because there's something about us coming together, male and female, that brings life. And so as a result, the two together in marriage is actually the clearest re representation of the unseen realm. And so there's also a truth here. Now, I, am, I don't want you to think that I'm coming against the Republican and I'm suddenly cheering on democratic uh, ideology. I'm not. However, I also don't want you to think of yourself first as a Republican, if you happen to be, or first as a Democrat, if you happen to be. If you seek being Jesus, seeing being like Jesus and revealing Jesus in this world, I believe it corrects your politics right along with it. And so therefore, where your politics are a little skewed, which many of us want to overemphasize the word skewed, it's like, boy, if you look at some of the thought patterns going on out there, it's like, how in the world can you vote that way? How could you think that way? Well, I believe that Jesus is a great corrector for that. John 19, 32 through 34, and the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. The bleeding heart. I want that. I'm not saying I want what the liberals have. I want what Jesus has. That's what I'm interested in. That's what this message is about. So 1B the bleeding-hearted Christian. Now, if you're seeing this, uh, either video or live, you see that I had liberal in there, just to sort of get you a little uncomfortable uh, in here. And I crossed it out, and I said, the bleeding-hearted Christian. Is it okay for the Christian to feel? And that's the key question that I want here, because if you've heard me teach, you know that I emphasize fact over feeling. In fact, it is essential for the Christian to make sure that they emphasize fact, which we could call the Word of God in text and the Word of God in person, Jesus Christ, over anything they feel. If you ask someone how they feel about picking up their cross and following Jesus and denying themselves, 
their feelings may not be in agreement. And so if we go to our feelings first, we will never follow the fact. We follow the fact even when our, our feelings scream in the opposite direction. Why? Because our feelings are off kilter. The feeling center of man is distorted, which I'm going to get to in just a second here. And therefore, it is an untrustworthy source. We need something outside of us called the truth that we adhere to. And when we do by faith, it actually sets the other dimensions of us free. So is it okay for the Christian to feel? I just had a few thoughts, and I threw them on the, on the page here. Richard Wormbrandt, please don't harm him. So that comes from, and this is way back, uh, Second World War time period, and the Nazis actually controlled Romania, and Richard Wormbrandt is a uh, Romanian pastor uh, back in the time of World War II, and the Nazis were over uh, Romania, and so, and he's Jewish, so you can just imagine how pleasant that was. And then Stalin, with his communism, is going to come in and shoo the Germans out of Romania, and now... Romania is under communist rule. And so when it was under Nazi rule, he was a Jew and they were trying to kill the Jews. When it's under communism, uh, which is anti-Christ, anti-Christian in every regard, now they're trying to kill the Christians. So it's like, wow, you can't win uh, at this, no matter who's controlling this country. And when, uh, when the communists are finally uh, dealt with and there is a revolution in Romania, this one man has suffered so greatly under the communists. So I don't remember if someone knows the exact amount of years he was in prison. I want to say like 20, but I'm not positive. 14. So he was in prison being tortured for 14 years because of the communists. And specifically, there was one man named Nikolai Ceausescu, who was like the, uh, the, the main leader, would be like the president uh, of, of the country during that whole time. A Romanian that had turned towards Soviet, uh, you know, comforts and under the, under the table type of uh, gifts so that he would basically betray his country and bring that iron boot or that uh, thumb down upon the country. And so this man has suffered, Richard Wormbrand has suffered under Nikolai Ceausescu. And in the revolution, the Romanian revolution, Nikolai Ceausescu falls into the hands of the people. Oh, that's not going to look good for this guy. And Richard Wormbrand pleads for his life. I think he's still in prison at the time. He pleads for Nikolai Ceausescu's life. And he says, please don't harm him. And what he, what he says is this. He is just a little boy that was never loved by a father and has never understood love. Give him an opportunity. I mean, that is one of the strangest conclusions you could ever have. Nikolai Ceausescu is one of the most barbaric humans that has ever lived. You wouldn't say that about Hitler or Stalin, would you? In other words, what you see coming out of Richard Wormbrand is very different. And I remember even pinning that way back in the day when I first heard, the, heard this story. It's just like, ah, it's uncomfortable for me because I'm inclined in this situation towards justice. Give Nikolai Ceausescu precisely what he deserves. And yet I want to pause right there and say, if we all get what we deserve, it's a sorry story for every single one of us. We have not received what we deserve. We have received what Christ deserves. And as a result, in every moment where there is mercy that can be given out, a Christian, I'm not talking about a Democrat or Republican, I'm saying a Christian specializes in mercy. Why? Because our God does. And our God lives in us. Our God is a specialist in mercy. Jur okay, so I'm, I have this, someone told me the other day I could actually turn it off, but when I open up my Firefox, they always have these little blocks of different articles. Uh, I think it's called Pocket or something like that. And there's nothing in there that is usually of any interest, but I always see the top line. And there's this one that pops up and it says, journaling is helpful to stave off night fears. And it has you know, someone journaling and some picture. And you know, you'd say, why would that make it on the screen during one of your sermons? It's because I feel like God is freshly bringing a theme to bear upon my soul. And it's weird because when you hear that, it doesn't mean anything, right? But it meant something to me in a strange way because I was thinking this. I was thinking there are people out there and probably so many that I couldn't count them that at night are living with great difficulty. They can't sleep. They have great guilt. 
They have great fears and anxieties, and they may lie awake and roll around, and you know that, that suffocating type of fear, if you've ever had that in the night, like a night terror, and, uh, and, and I was just thinking, and my heart was going out to all these people. I don't know who they are. I don't know their name, but if someone is writing an article, and it's like at the very top of this, it's like, yeah, all of us that have our night fears, this is a good way of dealing with it. It's like, so people have night fears. I don't have night fears, but people do. And I, I recognized it was like a sensitization within me that I need to remember that the way I live and the way we live here is very different than the way most people live. That apart from Christ, there is a terror. Apart from Christ, there is a weight of guilt and condemnation, and they have to justify all day long every day why they're fine. And so what a difficult thing to carry and oh Lord, could I do something to help those people? Aaron, the street beggar. So Hudson and I were sort of taking a back road uh, out of, uh, I don't even know why we were there. Uh, we, I think we were at Chipotle's, right? We were coming home from the airport is what it was this last week. And I, I know this little back way around to get uh, to, to where I needed to get home and not normal roads in other words. And there was a guy with sort of a mangled bicycle off to the side, and he had a sign, and he was sort of hiding behind the sign. And we've all seen the sign, okay? It usually says something about God bless you uh, and on it because they're, they're trying to manipulate us, right? Uh, you know, they use God, and somehow then we stop. And I am always a sucker for these people. Anyways, you know, even if you looked a little deeper, who knows? You might be concerned that I am a bleeding-hearted liberal, right? If you, if you dig deep enough, because I do care. And yet... I have the same thoughts go through my head that you probably do. It's like, oh, we got the con game going here. Yeah, it's quite the racket that these guys have. Have you ever seen them where they switch places, sort of give each other a high five? It's just like, I just saw that, guys. I know you're switching shifts. And then how about the person that drives up and picks them up and takes them back to home base? It's like, what? I just saw it. At least do it at night when no one's around. And so you get this dubious nature towards those that hold signs and say that they have need. And yet, one of the things that is important for us to remember is we are not first those that are supposed to bring the justice and those that are supposed to deal out, uh, the tr medi out the truth to everyone. We are the ones that are called to be Jesus. And when someone asks for uh, something from us, actually we're not supposed to just give them what they ask for, we're supposed to give them more than they ask for. And it doesn't say that their motives are correct when they ask. Isn't that an interesting thought? It doesn't say, hey, test their motives first, and if their motives are good, then give them. Now, I'm not interested in sponsoring a, uh, a drug habit or an alcohol habit any more than you guys are, and I understand that this is a challenging thing. However, it was interesting because Hudson and I stopped, and I was planning, I, had, I usually don't have any cash. I had, I had just a wad of ones in my pocket, and I remember I was picking it up, even as I was picking it out, I was thinking, okay, I'll take off like one or two of them, you know, because you, you don't want to give these guys too much, right? And then as, I, as he began to walk forward, and you could just see there was something about it that really touched me. He had a scar, a fresh scar right across his face. I didn't even read his sign, right? I don't read those things. They're all saying the same thing. However, something had happened in this man's life, some trauma, and he was currently in it, and I found myself just taking the whole lot. It's not that much, like 10 bucks, right? And I said, uh, here you go. Uh, and I asked what his name was, said it was Aaron, and I, I prayed for him. And I was actually holding his hand across poor Hudson. Hudson's right there, and I'm like holding his hand. <laughs> and while I was praying for him, I think Hudson would probably testify to the same thing. It's like, Lord, I, I want to be available to Aaron. I want to know how to help Aaron's. Lord, I, I can so easily lose touch with the Aaron's in this world because my life isn't like Aaron's. And this is where your heart is. And even as we were driving off, Hudson was like, I have some cash. And it was like, I, you know, and then you're going, it's like, do we turn around and give him more? Uh, and, but it was interesting to see even in Hudson, it's like, hey, we need to give more to this guy. There was something, and even Hudson and I were talking about it, he wasn't the typical guy on the street. He was in a back road that like two cars went by him in the entire time we were there, right? It wasn't a good place if you're going to beg for money. It was the place where he was. And 
I'm just bringing these up as things that are stirring inside of me. And then I was remembering this week Jackie Pullinger. Jackie Pullinger lived in the walled city of Hong Kong for, I don't know, 40 years. The police wouldn't even go in there. And she was so familiar with poverty. Everyone was suffering from poverty in the walled city of Hong Kong. Destitution. They were all drug addicted, and so they had to somehow make money to be able to uh, keep their drug addictions going. There was usually opium. And it was just the saddest stories when you hear them, but she came in there and lived amongst them. And the stories are extraordinary of what is going to happen. And then she comes back to America, and she's watching us live as the church, totally insensitive to the hurting around the world. But we are, you know, in our churches with our truth, and we're, you know, appreciating the truth and cherishing the truth, but we've lost something. There's like a desensitization in our inner man to what is actually on God's heart. And yet, we have the truth, and we are standing for the truth, but we're disconnected somehow from the heart. And I remember her describing a story of walking into a fast food restaurant, and she says, when you live around the poor, you recognize the poor, even if they don't want you to see them. Because it's, it's, whether it's a spirit of poverty, I don't know, whether it's a behavior of poverty, but she said she was, in this fast food restaurant, and she saw this person, she just instantly knew that that person didn't have any money. But they were still in the restaurant so hungry, but they didn't want to beg, and so there they were in the restaurant, and so she came up to them and said, I'd like to buy you your food. Thank you so much. And I remember just having that thought, Lord, do I see what you see? Do I feel what you feel? When I walk into that same restaurant, do I think that? Or am I so hardened in my little world that unless someone comes up to me and says, could you buy me lunch? And then even then, if you go in the Republican version of things, you're like, hey, this is not a welfare state. Go and get a job and work for yourself. You follow me? What I don't want to be is a Republican Christian. I want to be a Christian Christian. I do not want to be so right that I end up being wrong. I want us to make sure that we have a heart that is tender and sensitive to what God is doing in the lives around us. And if that means every one of our $10 bill, every one of our $1 bills, which equals $10, is asked for. Every time we go out, you can see, you're like, God, I don't know that I want to take any cash this time because you could ask for it. Take it. In other words, risk it. This is the reason you even have resource is to serve Jesus, not to serve yourself. He'll take care of you. And he's not against you caring for your family. But it's knowing how to live with both hands. Knowing how to serve that which is true. Knowing how to hold on to that which is right. And knowing how to feel what God feels. Remember, or this is still in the red. Uh, the dangerous Republican conclusion. Now, I guarantee you, not, you know, if you consider yourself Republican in here, you're probably going, I don't think that. And I, I would go along with you in that. Okay, this is an extreme statement, and so will the Democrat statement that I'm going to come up with next. They are just getting what they deserve. If someone lives according to a lie, and they experience the traumas because of it, and they end up in living you know, in, on the streets under a bridge, they're just getting what they deserve. And you would be right. You could be so right in your conclusion, and yet you could be wrong in your actual makeup as a Christian. 1D, the dangerous Democrat conclusion. They should not get what they deserve. Now, I don't know if you're thinking deep enough to understand the dangers in that, but it's based on a part truth. Both of them are based on a part truth. You know that God is going to judge the world? There's a great white throne of judgment, and God is just. It is true, and we will get what we deserve, which is why Jesus came, so that we would not get what we deserve. However, when you conclude and you build a society based on the fact that they should not get what they deserve, in other words, well, your child just disobeyed. Yeah, but we're not going to discipline them because we don't want to give our children what they deserve, right? It's like uh, you're also setting a very dangerous precedent in a different way because you will never appreciate the shed blood of Jesus unless you recognize that there really are consequences for your decisions. And so you recognize both sides of the equation need each other. We actually need each other as far as vantage point to recognize. So 1E, the proper conclusion. 
But for the grace of God, there goest I. God has shown me mercy. I want that person to know the same mercy. It is not throwing out the truth of God. It is not endorsing behavior that is contrary to the kingdom of heaven. However, it is extending the mercy that is revealed in this truth to this realm of people that have not even accepted Christ. You don't wait to give people mercy until they bend their knee and declare that Jesus is Lord. Jesus Christ has extended mercy to all of us long before we even repented. We're still alive and still breathing. The fact that there are people out there still alive and still breathing, though the decisions they've made are so extreme against God, shows a merciful God right there. God is extending mercy and so do we. There's an insidious distortion that we have begun to see awaken in our culture. It's awakened in many other cultures in the past that are based on what we could call a two-party system. The two-party system is extremes, okay? And you could say conservative and liberal. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Pharisees are conservatives, the Sadducees are liberals. And they had the same system, and guess what? You're not gonna see Jesus coming and supporting Pharisaical Christianity, which would be the conservative version. What you're going to see is him taking, picking a fight with them maybe more than anyone else. And yet it's not because they were wrong. They were right. They knew where the child, you know, the Christ child was going to be born. He was born in Bethlehem. They understood the scriptures and they crucified Jesus. What we don't want is to be so right that we are wrong. And so as a result, there is an insidious distortion that can enter into a culture. And I would say in the last 10 years especially, this is skyrocketed. It's always been there, sort of the mumble and the grumble. When I was growing up, you know, my dad would have his kitchen conversations with us about what was going on in the government and be upset with, you know, uh, it was always a Kennedy. A Kennedy was always doing something. My, my grandpa used to always say, I grew up in a very densely thick Republican environment. My, my grandpa would say this, uh, you know how I vote? Uh, how do you vote, grandpa? I find out what Ted Kennedy votes and I vote the opposite. Well, that's really smart, uh, Grandpa. That's really smart. (laughs) However, though you didn't like the opponent, you still had a certain civility. Civility is no more. Something happened, I would say, when Trump was elected, civility went to the wind. And I'm not just blaming Trump. I'm saying civility went to the wind. I've never seen such disregard for a president in my life as I saw towards Trump. And yet, the way Trump has handled his opponents is equally mm, harsh. And so what we have is a culture of harshness, and let me say it this way, of hatred. There is now a hatred towards those on the opposite side as opposed to a love. Uh, Wait, 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 what are we? Are we Republicans or are we Christians? Because if we're Christians, even though they may hate us, we love them. Always. So this is it from my World War I series. Vladimir Lenin, uh, this is his entire motto. He's shared it with his commissars, the basis for communism. He says, we must hate. Hatred is the basis for communism. All right, guys, if you don't want to go in that direction, let's change it now. Our opponent is not that which is on the opposite side of the ideological political counter. Our opponent is spiritual. First and foremost, we must recognize that we have a spiritual opponent who is trying to play us against other humans. And we will not fall for it because we are believers in Jesus Christ and Christ lives in us and Christ gave up his life for that person. How much more so should we be ready to do the same? So I'm only on the second color here. This will start to go a lot faster. That first color I really milked uh, for all it was worth. Two, fact, faith, and feelings. So instead of saying fact, faith, and experience, which is my typical way of of describing it, the three characters that are called to walk the ridgepole of a barn, as the story goes, and that ridgepole sounds easy to walk, but it's not. It's, It's like a razor's edge. And so these three characters are called to do it, and the first character known as fact, which we don't use the term fact typically in Christianity, we use the term truth. It's actually a person, his name is Jesus, is going to pull off the impossible. And faith, which is where we are, if it fixes its gaze on the fact, can actually gain balance and pull off an impossible life. And life would be all good and well if there were only two characters, but there's three. There's this dimension called feeling. 
And when you allow feeling to govern your life, it turns faith in the direction of feeling. In other words, you end up believing that which you feel instead of that which is revealed, that which is truth. And what happens? Faith loses balance, falls off the ridge pole, and lands in that <clears throat> cow patty at the bottom of the barn. And many of us have spent a good deal of our life in that cow patty, staring up at this lofty call of God. And yet, the key isn't to forsake feelings. God isn't against feelings. He says that feelings were never meant to lead. Fact is meant to lead. So when faith follows fact, then feelings actually can gain balance if they are ignored. In other words, where feeling doesn't define how you walk, however, it accompanies and it supports how you walk. And that is what is oftentimes missing today. So here's a, a, I lifted this out of Streams in the Desert, September 26. Those that are students that have heard me share fact, faith, and experience, I don't know how many times we're at, like 15 or 16 now in the semester. Uh, listen to this. You'll, you'll find this very fascinating. God never wants us to look at our feelings. Self may want us to, and Satan may want us to, but God wants us to face facts, not feelings. The facts of Christ and of his finished and perfect work for us. When we face these precious facts and believe them because God says they are facts, God will take care of our feelings. God never gives feeling to enable us to trust him. God never gives feeling to encourage us to trust him. God never gives feeling to show that we have already and utterly trusted him. God gives feeling only when he sees that we trust him apart from all feeling, resting on his own word and on his own faithfulness to his promise. Never until then can the feeling, which is from God, possibly come. And God will give the feeling in such a measure and at such a time as his love sees best for the individual case. We must choose between facing towards our feelings and facing toward God's facts. Our feelings may be as uncertain as the sea or the shifting sands. God's facts are as certain as the rock of ages, even Christ himself, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Doesn't that sound like a nice lesson from Ellerslie right there? There it is in streams in the desert. All right, hey guys, we're on the third color. We're already at Roy. We finished up Roy out of Roy G. Biv. Isn't that fun to be on yellow already? The power of God feelings. Isn't that a weird thought to think that God has feelings? We could make it sound like feelings are the enemy. Feelings are wrong. When in actuality, as it says, remember, God made us in his own image. He made us to feel. He did. However, those feelings are never, were never supposed to be the lead instrument of our life. Part of what's going to happen because of sin is there's going to be a distortion in us which is going to elevate an aspect of who we are over what it was originally intended to be. So though something's off in us as humans because of sin, Jesus Christ in his work on the cross desires to set us back in working order. And so the power of God feelings John 11, 32 through 35. This includes, in verse 35, we have the shortest verse in the Bible, which is always one of our favorite uh, trivial uh, statements as little kids. Remember that? What's the shortest verse in the Bible? We're like, I know that one. John eleven thirty five. 35. Uh, Jesus wept. Well, that's in this, okay? So all of you, that little kid side of you can come out in this one. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother, who is Lazarus, would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then there we go. Jesus wept. It's a profound statement. And the fact that it's only two words and it's an entire you know, verse in and of itself is, is rather profound too. In other words, our God, when you see Jesus, you see the Father. And what Jesus does, he only does that which the Father is doing. So it's a weird thought to think that when Jesus feels, he's feeling in agreement with the Father's feelings. He's the perfect enunciation. When you look at Jesus, you're seeing the Father. And so you're seeing the Father in this situation. You're seeing the Father look upon Mary. And even though Jesus knows what he's about to do, he still feels the human condition. He understands it. He's been tried and tested in every way as we are. He understands this situation known as humanity. He really does. And he cares deeply about it. It's an amazing thought to think that God feels. 
Jesus feels. Luke 19, 41. Now Jesus drew near. He saw the city and wept over it. We're talking about a God. I mean, this is the revelation of the unseen God, right? This is the revelation of the Father right here. And there is this dimension of feeling in our God. And we are made in his image. In other words, we're designed to feel. However, I'm going to emphasize the fact that those feelings are not the lead. However, they're supposed to still be there. Number four, sin, the distortion of human feelings. The end result is a heart of stone. It is interesting to think that if you are outside of Jesus, though you feel, your feelings are not actually a derivative of God's heart. They're a derivative of a self-heart. And so even with your self-heart, which is twisted by sin, there is still a shadow element of how we were designed, which is why you care about that squirrel being shot by your younger brother. It's like, don't do it! And, you know, I have a, a few characters in my home that would probably stand in front and say, take me instead! <laughs> and it's a wonderful quality. And it's like a shadow instinct. In other words, this dimension of who we are, of having natural compassion, and when we see things, we say, that is wrong. This is part of how God wired us. However, we are not as we ought to be. We're not fully set free. Because of sin, our heart is encased, and it is self-reflecting. Self so if it doesn't benefit us in some way, we're willing to forsake it. And so, which is why, you know, a good man may die for another good man, but a good man would never die for his enemy. And what you're going to see God do is his heart is uncased. His heart is different. And he's willing to give up his life even for his enemy. It's like, whoa, guys, we have a whole nother level here. That's right. It's a supernatural level. It's a heavenly reflection. God's heart is so much greater than man's heart. And so we can applaud the liberal heart, but it's a heart oftentimes that is separated from God's heart. So as a result, it's feeling, and its feelings are good. In their, 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 they mean well. They're sincere, but they're not accurate. The only way to have your feelings become accurate is you have to submit them. You have to give them up. You have to pick up a cross and give up your life as a sacrifice. And then it comes over into God's camp. And he can take that feeling center and he transforms a heart of stone into what's called a heart of flesh. I don't know if that's the best term for it because of the way Paul is going to use the term flesh in the New Testament is a negative. However, if you could say a heart full of grace, teeming with grace, it's a heart that is soft to feel what God feels. So here's the scripture in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, a heart that is now soft, a heart that is able to now feel what God feels. Number five, we're on blue. So what do we have, Roy and G? Now we're on B. So the temple of the Holy Spirit. God behavior takes place here in this body. Could you imagine wearing a t-shirt like that? God behavior takes place here in this body. I would not necessarily encourage you to go out and just print that t-shirt right away and wear it unless it's true. In other words, that's a big statement. It's supposed to be the statement of Christianity. However, we have to understand, this is the lack of discipleship in the church oftentimes stunts us, where we esteem Christ, but Christ doesn't ever move in and transform us. You see, we are a house, according to Scripture, and this house was built by God for God, just like the temple of God was. And there is an outer court, an inner court, and a holy of holies in us. We're a temple. We're built just like the Old Testament temple, which is built just like the heavenly temple. And Jesus is going to be the heavenly temple on two legs. And he is going to come and model what it's like to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to do what God would do with the temple. He's going to be called the high priest. He is going to intercede on our behalf so that we too could return to our original design. And we could become the house of God. And that the Holy Spirit could move in and take over what is rightfully his. So we are supposed to be the temple of the living God. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now what's interesting, there's a chunk of Christianity that does know that. And I would say most of Christianity knows the scripture, 
But there's a whole sector of Christianity that I would say knows the scripture but doesn't know that in reality. I remember even processing through this. I knew that scripture all growing up. And I remember reading that A.W. Tozier book, which was called the, uh, God's Pursuit of Man. I think that's what it's called now. It used to be called The Divine Conquest. And it was basically A.W. Tozier saying, Eric, you're holding the keys to your house, and Jesus wants to move in via his Holy Spirit. And so he's knocking on the door. Will you let him not just come in, but then have the keys, where this is no longer your house, your ownership, but his and I remember it, it hit me at a whole nother level of practicality. It's like, whoa, what does this actually mean? 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? Paul again in Ephesians 2. Jesus, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And here we are at 1 Peter 2, 5. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So when you study Leviticus in the Old Testament, you see the pattern of how a priest is supposed to function in the temple of God. You recognize how we, as priests, are called to function in the house of God. That there are sacrifices that we're offering, but he's offered the final sacrifice, right? Yeah. But there's a, there's a sacrifice we are supposed to offer, a humble and a contrite heart before him, our praise and our worship, the incense. This, we're supposed to be priests in this house, and there's a, there's a function that we have which is in agreement with our original design. All right, guys, we're at uh, indigo. I know that, I, I'm sure when I pro, uh, popped that uh, color up there, you guys were like, oh, yeah, classic indigo. Uh, but number six, the choicest part of the sacrifice. So there is a part of the sacrifice in the, in the Old Testament when the priests were bringing in the rams, the bulls, the goats, that God said, that's mine. That's my part. There was a part that even the, the priests themselves could eat, and there's another part that should be burned up. But there was a part that was meant for God. Isn't that sort of an odd thought? Why, why would God want that? And yet it's a symbol of something. We don't want to miss it. It's called the call and the kidneys. That belongs to God. It's also known as the heart and the reins. Now, reins, if you're hearing this via podcast, reins is R-E-I-N-S. It's not the, like, the Lord reigns, R-E-I-G-N-S. So R-E-I-N-S, the reins. It's like the kidneys. Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. It's sort of a scary thought to think that the Lord is searching our hearts and reins. Some of you are like, I don't even know what that is, and he's searching it. <laughs> this is the part that God is after in us, too, and he searches us, and so that he can give us according to the fruit of our doings. Uh, how do you feel about that? If God is going to search every aspect of you and give you according to the fruit of your doings, uh, I don't know that I'm going to receive the best reward, which is why he came on that cross. Because, first of all, he knows that the fruit of your doings is insufficient. You have not done your job as you were designed. And as a result, you are cut off from him. And there is a just penalty over you. But God, his heart has bled for you. He cares deeply about you so that you would not receive the fruit of your doings, but you would receive, get this, the fruit of his doings. That's what the gospel is. You are receiving the fruit of his doings. Because in his heart and reins, there was perfection. There was the way a man was designed to be, and he was that offering instead of us. Proverbs 17, 3, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. Psalm 26, 2, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. So 6A is the heart and the reins. So this is still our indigo color. And I'm going to say this is the choice section of the sacrifice or God's portion. So I'm going to just teach you really quick on the heart and reins, okay? So you can at least have an understanding. The heart and reins are the center of all spiritual life, the axis of the will and desire, the seat of all thoughts, passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, endeavors. It's the middle of man's being and thus the fountain of every good or bad that proceeds from his life. So if your heart and reins are bad, that means what comes out of your life is bad. 
If your heart and reins is separated unto Jesus Christ and filled with the Holy Spirit, then what comes out is actually called the fruit of the Spirit. If the reins are removing impurity, because they're like the kidneys, right? And that's what kidneys do, they purify the blood. So if the reins are removing impurity, then the heart is pure, commissioning the life through the entire body. If the heart is circulating the life, then the reins can eliminate the impure elements, thus creating a healthy being. The two organs work in tandem. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't that sound a little like Republicans and Democrats? Uh, it's like the Republicans are the kidneys, and they're purifying everything. Okay, it's like, that doesn't belong. And then guess who's the big heart? The liberals. And, but guess what? They need to work in tandem. For the physical body to work, you actually need both and. Now, I am, again, I'm not endorsing modern liberalism, okay? I am endorsing having the heart of God. That is what I'm not saying that modern liberals have the heart of God, just as a side note here. But I'm saying that they are inclined towards something that is complementary if we see it. Franz Delich says this, when man is suffering most deeply within, he is pricked in his kidneys or his reins. When fretting affliction overcomes him, his kidneys are cloven asunder, and that's from Job 16, 13, and compare that with Lamentations 3, 13. When he rejoices profoundly, they exult, or his reins or his kidneys exult in Proverbs 23, 7. When he feels himself very penetratingly warned, they chasten him, that's Psalm 16, 7. When he earnestly longs, they are consumed away with his body. That's Job 19, 27. As the omniscient and all-penetrating knower of the most secret hidden things of man, God is frequently called the trier of the hearts and reins. And of the ungodly, it is said that God is far from their reins. Jeremiah 12, 2. That is that he, being withdrawn back into himself, allows not himself to be perceived by them. Here's Charles Spurgeon's statement on the matter. He trieth the hearts, and then Charles Spurgeon says that's the secret thoughts, and the reins, the inward affections. This is God's part of the sacrifice. William Lindsay Alexander says, reins, from the sensitiveness to pain of this part of the body, it was regarded by the Hebrews as the seat of sensation and feeling, as also of desire and longing. In other words, God desires this to be his, but what is this? This is the center of your feelings. This is what is supposed to be given to him in that offering. When you, when you offer the sacrifices that you are supposed to as the priest in God's temple, what are you giving him? He's like, could I have those heart and reins? And so we offer him our heart and our reins so that then his Holy Spirit can take those and inhabit them and use them as he intended within this body. So now we're going to combine some colors. Isn't that fun? Look at that rainbow color. It doesn't have... Uh, the violet up there yet? I know you guys are, are feeling that, that, that missing piece. However, we're going to say taking the reins. Now, that's a play on words because when you take the reins, you take a different sort of reins, right? Uh, and yet, that's what God is needing to do. He needs to take over our reins. He needs to take over that feeling center of our being. God must command, take command of this territory inside of us. So look at this one. This is all six of those colors too. It's called the work of the temple. In Exodus 69, we see a picture of the consecration of the priests so that they are fit to actually work in the temple. And there's all sorts of incredible and very unique pictures that are going to unfurl in that chapter. And this is one of the statements that is said in that chapter. Exodus 29, 13. And you shall take all the fat that covers the inwards and the call that is above the liver and the two kidneys. So that's the heart and the reins. And the fat that is on them and burn them upon the altar. So this is a very specific thing. You're supposed to take this out and offer it to God in a separate way. And for us, this seems to be our preparation to really function in this body as well. That God says, could I have the heart and reins? Could I have that center of thought and that center of affection and feeling? Could I have that? Because as long as you control it, you're gonna steer your life in the wrong direction. But if I have that, this life can suddenly function as it ought. God didn't design you just to esteem truth, just to have the right doctrinal conclusion. He also built you to feel in agreement with that so that your heart and your reins, the innermost part of you, would actually agree that it would have compassion when it's supposed to have compassion, that it would have empathy, that it would have delight, that it would have longing in agreement with the truth, not in contradiction. Most of us have emotion that is in contradiction to the truth but you're supposed to have agreement with it 
so that your feelings actually sponsor and push your growth towards truth as opposed to hold you back and say, don't go in that direction, Ludi. Instead, it is like the push where you actually long to be following Jesus. You long, just like Ignatius when he was told he was going to be fed to the lions. He was discipled by the apostle John. And he rejoices. What? And he declares the lions to be his friends because they're going to lead him into the presence of the one he loves more than his life. That's when you know that your heart and your reins is captured by Jesus Christ because then when you are called by Jesus to even give up your life, your emotional center pushes and you rejoice. How many Christians throughout the ages have walked into the arena where the lions are about to eat them and they sing? What is that? That's heart and reins captured by Jesus and even in their emotions, they're taking delight in the day. They're taking delight in the fact that they could be offered up for Jesus. What is that? We want to circle it and say, okay, God, I want that. That's what I said a long time ago when I started reading Fox's Book of Martyrs and Martyr's Mirror. I was like, what is that? I want that. And that's where it starts for all of us to recognize that there's a higher form of living. And it's not Democrat or Republican, it's Christian. We are called to have a heart and a reins that is in agreement with the mind of Christ. And when these organs start functioning in agreement as opposed to contrary to one another, you have crisis. Bearing his burdens in this world, offering our call and kidneys, or our heart and our reins, to the Lord that they might bleed and burn as he pleases him. Don't you like that? Bleed and burn. I almost called this message bleed and burn. Because what you see with this is there's, there is blood in this. Okay, you're cutting out the call and kidneys, right? There's blood at the cross, Yeah. And yet, then it needs to be burned. It needs to be offered up to God. That's how you feed him, in a sense. And so, our hearts are meant to burn for Christ. If you've ever had that fire of devotion inside of you, it is very interesting when it sets a flame. And you can't keep your mouth shut. And you long to see people know Jesus. You care about the lost. Well, I've never cared before in my life, and suddenly, I care and that is something that needs to happen in all of us. And what's interesting is that fire can dim if it's not, if kindling, fresh kindling is not stuck on it. There are things that I have burned for, like the errands on the side of the road. There have been times in my life when all I wanted to do, I remember one time I was going to actually live on the streets in New Orleans with all of the uh, poor guys down there, all the homeless. And I was going to do it. I don't remember what happened. Something happened in my life which detoured it, and I never was able to do it. But I was sincere. And that's where I wanted to be. My heart was beating so big for those that had nothing, and I just wanted to share Jesus with them. And if I need to get into their skin, if I need to walk a mile in their shoes, so be it. And yet what happens is if you don't feed fresh kindling to that, it just sort of dims, and theologically you agree with it. Oh yeah, God cares about them. But you don't care anymore. In, in agreement with God, your mind and your call and kidneys seem to be separate and now you've become a two-party system where you're almost arguing with yourself. So I'm going to read this scripture again, and I want you to just imagine that this is us with God. And you shall take all the fat that covers the inwards and the call that is above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and burn them upon the altar. Lord, here's my innermost man, and I want it to burn for you. I want to feel what you feel. I want to ache for what you ache for. And I don't want to be satisfied with a comfortable life. I want to live for you. And if that means inconvenience, so be it. I want my emotion to be in agreement with that. I want my feelings to be in agreement with what you have called me to. What this mind is fixed upon is your word, your calling, your commission. The way you lived is the way I want to live. Uh-oh, guys, we have all seven colors up on the screen. Isn't that amazing? The supernatural burden. That took a long time to make all those colors uh, in that. The inexplicable burden that comes from God alone. So what we're actually talking about is something different. than It's not something you whip up. You don't whip up the burden of God inside of you. You offer up your call and kidneys. You offer up this part of you and say, God, this belongs to you. And I want you to have it you to inhabit it, you to set your fire within it so that what I feel actually is now in agreement with your word, 
So as I follow your word, my feelings begin to push. They're like a propulsion behind me instead of a contradiction behind me. I still remember uh, when Leslie and I were feeling moved. We felt freshly moved. We'd adopted Harper, and, which was a life-transforming process for us. And we had felt the heart of God unlike any other time in our life, I would say. It was so extraordinary that this child that wasn't born from us, we cared so deeply about. We would lay down our life for her. She was in our will. Harper made it into our will. We didn't even know who she was. We hadn't even met her yet, and she was in our will. Isn't that an incredible thought? And then we had this thought, because two kids, that's a lot, boy, guys, if you've ever had two kids, especially two little ones, that's a lot of work. And then inexplicably, we had this desire to be available to God for adoption again. My God, what's going on inside of us? Why would we want that? There's a part of me that's sort of like, this is ridiculous. And another part of me that was in agreement with what the Word of God was saying, which is our marriage and our home belong to God. Just like our colon kidneys, those belong to God. And now suddenly there's this propulsion from behind saying, Eric, you care. And so we had this situation where this young girl was pregnant and I had this burden that maybe we should adopt her, her child. And it seemed so ridiculous that I would even have the thought. And I still remember Leslie and I were in our upstairs room, which we called the upper room, and we were praying that God would g- allow us to raise this child. His name is Kipling. And I remember stopping and saying to, to Leslie, I said, do you realize that something is either wrong with us or extremely right with us because we are asking God to bring challenge into our life. We are asking God to bring financial weights into our life. Who would, in their right mind would pray for that? If, if you knew what it was like to raise kids, wouldn't you just say, God, never allow me to have kids? Or if you have the heart of God and you recognize his system and you recognize that those inconveniences actually become strength in the hand of a warrior. That these seeming insignificance to your emotional center when it's a heart of stone, when it becomes a heart that is softened, suddenly begins to think different and feel different to the point where you begin to ask God to be sent somewhere in the world where there people have never heard the gospel. It's like, do you realize what you're asking there? You do know that they may kill you. I know. And what an honor it would be. You see, Christians think different. We think like the Word of God. And get this, Christians feel different. We feel like God himself feels. For God so loved that he gave. You are meant to be changed in the inner man, not just in the mind. Where your mind is suited and situated to agree with the scriptures, but then your call in your kidneys, that innermost part of you that feels, is given to him and allowed to beat with his burdens. Father, I ask that you would do just that in us. Lord, here we are, and we offer up that innermost part of who we are, our call, our kidneys, our heart, our reins. Lord, forgive us for putting too much attention in one direction and turning off the knob, the volume knob on the other. Lord, balance us. Push, put fresh kindling on that fire. Lord, that we would burn for what burns inside of you. There's some of us that have cared deeply for the, the lost, but we've grown cold. There's some of us that have burned deeply for the unborn in the womb, and yet it has grown dim. There are some of us that have burned deeply for the orphan, for the widow, but the, the heart has grown dim, even though we theologically and doctrinally still agree. Lord, do what you must inside of us, the church. Start with us, Lord. May your fire come down upon this altar in our hearts and may it consume the call and kidneys, that which satisfies you, that we may be moved forward, propelled forward, compelled by your love to care for the poor in the local fast food restaurant, to care for the errands on the side of the road, to care for the little Kiplings that are there in the womb. 
Lord Jesus, there are those out there that you care about right now, and I pray that you would place them upon our heart. We say yes to that and all the inconvenience that accompanies it. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray this. Amen.